And welcome back to another episode of Be Successful, everyone. Today is going to be a very, I have a feeling, a very insightful conversation. I have a guest here, Dave Robinson, who is a story coach. His specialty is helping people get out of imposter syndrome and redefine the stories that we're telling ourselves. So this is super relevant. And as my journey as a coach, as someone who is helping people create financial wealth in their own families and in their lives, the stories that we tell ourselves are so important. So Dave, I cannot wait to speak with you on this. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. Brian, thank you for having me, man. I'm thrilled to chat with you and uh, share some some insights with your audience today. We were just talking a little bit about a, a shared career path from from back in the day on the you know prior to hitting recording. So this is going to be a lot of fun, man. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to it as well. So let's just dive right in, dude. Let's talk about your journey because I always I typically like to start with people at the beginning of you know what I know of them and with the our conversation we were just having. You mentioned you were in the financial space, um, just like I am now as a financial planner, and you felt stuck. You knew it just became very clear to you that it wasn't right. And I'm curious, what story were you telling yourself that brought you into that world and also kept you there until you start feeling that disconnection, dissatisfaction? Yeah, great, great question and way to kick it off. Um, so I actually went to college to become a high school history teacher. And that was my my plan all four years until like April of my senior year, like weeks before I graduated. And then I had a falling out with the subject matter. And so I tend to do a pretty good job over my life of separating the logic from what I'm thinking, my head from my heart, from what I'm feeling and like actually listening to my gut, even though it sometimes takes me a while to get around to listening to that gut intuition and that gut feeling, because I'll feel a certain way or I'll, um, you know, emotion wise, or I'll think a certain way and logic my way into, you know, doing one thing or not doing another. But um, I knew for a while that I didn't want to actually teach high school history. I just wanted my summers off and to coach high school soccer. And I, I had the awareness to look forward and understand like, well, Dave, like, you don't want to be that teacher that like, doesn't care, right? That wasn't, you know, ever what I wanted to be. But I also knew I wanted to help people and be in the service industry and make an impact, right? And so uh, about three weeks, four weeks before I graduated, I have this falling out with the subject matter of history. Uh, it had to do with Christopher, Christopher Columbus, you know, who we've been learning about since we were five years old, 1492, sail the ocean blue. It happened, you know, we were spent like two weeks on Christopher Columbus in my senior capstone class. And I just, I broke, man, I lost it. I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> so, uh, I, so what, um, okay. So just real quick, yeah. what was it about, what was it about Christopher Columbus that like was the, the straw that broke the camel's back? Does he, does he feel like we've been told the wrong version of that story or like we're not being hold, told the whole truth or what was that? What was going on? That was, that was part of it because I, I felt like it was being, for lack of a better term, like whitewashed, right? Uh, the actual like real history of what was going on. And I didn't feel like necessarily the whole truth was being told in many ways, but I also felt like it doesn't matter. Like it didn't matter. Like I was spending two weeks of my life learning about this thing that I already had been learning about since I was, you know, in, in basically kindergarten, but it had no effect on me as a human being. And it had no effect on my future or my ability to make a change or impact or health or wealth or like anything that I deemed important. And, you know, like not to say that history is not important. History is very important, but it just got, I just got it beat out of me. I got the love of it beat out of me, you know, with, with this particular thing. So, um, I, I realized that that wasn't the subject matter I wanted to teach or coach or advise on. And so I had fallen in love with strength and conditioning uh, ever since my random roommate on day one of my freshman year uh, happened to be a, like a four or five time national junior powerlifting champion. So I, uh, I was always an athlete growing up. I wasn't like a, a 
great athlete by any means, but I was very well-rounded, spent a ton of time outside, always playing lots of different sports and, you know, trying to better myself physically. And this was a new thing that I got to dive into and fall in love with. And with that came, uh, it was very broad in that I started to research and and fall in love with nutrition. I started to research and fall in love with all the different types of strength and conditioning and training and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so much so that I got a job in the library so I could go and have access to, to, you know, these PubMed articles and these old, you know, books and stuff. And they'd make my rounds and I'd just get lost in the, you know, in the actual section, they'd have to like come find me and be like, dude, you're on the clock, like stop reading. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I just, I became so obsessed with that particular subject matter and probably a little bit too late. Cause I would have shifted my major if I had, kind of uh, uh, discovered that, I guess, a little bit earlier, but I had a powerlifting competition in my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, which is where I live now with my fiance. And um, the guy who I was in the same weight class with, you know, these are like 12 hour days and it's, it's a sport that I dropped a long time ago, but, but at the time it was, you know, a, a big focus and passion of mine. And we got to know one another over the course of the day. And Towards the end of the day, he said, well, dude, you're graduating in a couple of weeks. What, what are you going to do next? And I said, Jay, I have no idea, buddy. <laughs> I have no idea. And uh, it turns out they had a, a position open at the University of Richmond to become a strength and conditioning coach. And so I went in, I applied, I got the job. Um, I worked there with football, men's soccer, women's soccer, field hockey, and lacrosse for more than a calendar year. And I was working with a youth sports development team as well and program as well in town and trying to become a personal trainer. And what I found was that as much as I personally loved training and strength and conditioning and health and all these things, I did not love spending 15 hours a day in the gym. Uh, a lot of times, like over the winter, I'd go in there for the 6 a.m. training program and it was like a, a building underneath the basketball stadium at the university and like I'd come out and it was dark and I went in and it was dark and I went days at a time without seeing the sun and that was not cool no um, so I had no flexibility of time or income which were the two things that I desired greatly as a 23 year old 22 23 year old uh you know kid man coming out of college and you know, okay, now I want to start to make something of myself, right? So that was the reason why I got into financial planning. And the story I was telling myself at the time was, um, you know, with a financial focus and like kind of going and putting a suit on and getting a big boy job and, you know, doing what I'm quote unquote supposed to do, I will gain that flexibility of time and income and also make an impact. And so where I that's where I ended up. I worked there until I was almost 29 years old. Um, so I was a six year career in the financial planning industry. And I was very lucky to have great mentors and we, we did things the right way. It was fully comprehensive and it just made sense. Like how to, how to fit a financial plan together. Everything works in concert with one another that overlapped with how you fit a training program together, how like everything matters and works in concert with one another. And so it just kind of made sense to, to make that transition. Makes perfect sense. Absolutely. And what I, oh, go ahead. What I found towards the end of my career was that um, I actually, so I got bit by a spider. This is a, an interesting story. Uh, I get bit by a spider and I was in the hospital for like three days. Whoa, and, serious spider. Yeah, it was, it was a good, it was a good bite. It was a good bite. It was on my elbow. And uh, I'm not sure exactly like when or where I got bit, but I think it was actually in my office that I got bit. But, um, you know, it progressed very rapidly. I was misdiagnosed for the first time I went to the hospital. They thought I had like, I don't know what they thought, but they gave me like ibuprofen and told me to come back in 48 hours if it didn't get better. And so I'm like puking that night. I've got a fever. My elbow is the size of a softball, you know, and I go in and I had a, a lunch pre-scheduled with a a friend of mine who's in the medical industry. And as soon as I walked in, she was like, Oh my God, like what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, and <laughs> you I was like, terrible. What? That <laughs> you, know, you can tell just as I walk in the door, you know, and I told her the story and she was like, I'm going to get a, a doctor on FaceTime right now. And if he says to go to the hospital, like, will you go? And I was like, all right, fine. All right, I'll go back. And he did the same thing. He took one look at me and was like, Oh my God, dude, you got to go to the hospital. So I was like, fine, I'll go. So I was a little bit stubborn, but not too stubborn. So 
uh, long story short, I, I get in at like Friday, you know, mid morning or something like that. And by Saturday night, turning to Sunday morning, like 1 a.m. Sunday morning, they had figured it out. They had got the infection down. They gave me the antibiotics and rehydrated me and, you know, et cetera. And, and I was going to be released Sunday afternoon. So I get this, this download at, you know, 1 a.m. Sunday morning as I'm like hooked up to all the different tubes and drips and morphine or whatever else they were, they were giving me for everything. And I had the thought of, oh, today's Sunday. That means tomorrow's Monday. Oh, means I got to go back to work. Maybe I'll just stay here another day. And it was like yeah. lightning bolt to the head of, dude, you want to stay in a hospital bed rather than go work at your own firm, helping people doing this thing. And I, I had this come to Jesus moment of, you know, where I like fast forwarded and I, in my life and I was like, yeah, okay, I'll have flexibility of income and yeah, I've got flexibility of time and yeah, I make an impact, but it's not what I'm meant to do. And mm -hmm. I, I fast forwarded and realized like, oh, that's a B minus life, B plus tops, which is great. And what if I did what I really, really wanted to do? What if I did something different? And so uh, I knew in that moment that my head and my heart and my gut were finally aligned. That was August of 2017. And I put in my my three months as opposed to my two weeks. And you know, I was out my last day was November 15th of 2017. And I, I got back into coaching, which at the time was fitness, which turned into health. And then that turned into story, story work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. You would rather be in the hospital than go back to the job. And yeah, that is a, that's definitely a shock to the system moment. It's like, wow, how many people would say that? Yeah, it was ding, 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 you know, and, and logically, right. There was the opportunity cost of, I've spent more than half a decade doing this. I've spent tons of money, tons of time. I've learned another language effectively, right. Finance is not an easy thing to to, to learn. It wasn't my education, you know, so I had to start over from scratch essentially to, to gain the skill set. I had clients, I had firms, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, you know, my heart was like, ah, like this is going to be really hard, mm. <laughs> you know, but I knew it was something that I, I had to do if I wanted to live a life that was fully expressed and to really, what I like to say is like live in all caps. You know, I didn't want to undercase live. I wanted to uppercase live. So I made the Interesting jump. way to phrase that. I like that. Yeah. And so when you got out of the financial planning industry and you went into the coaching, you said you started with fitness, went to health, and then that kind of finally migrated into what you're doing now. I'm wondering, I've never heard of this story rewriting coaching before. You know, and I, I started my journey as a coach, basically helping out beginning entrepreneurs to not do the mistakes that I did when I started my first business, which caused it to shut down. And so I'm very familiar with uh, imposter syndrome and understanding that, you know, the things we tell ourselves are not true, but as far as actually getting into rewriting and having this, this sector of the coaching business. I've never heard of that before. Was this something that you came up with or were you trained on this by somebody else? Yeah, I was mentored by a, a dear friend of mine um, who I got, was very lucky to come across. Uh, it's a style of coaching that uh, was actually developed in conjunction with a couple other different styles, right? So there's some aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy in this. There's some as aspects of um, neuro-linguistic programming. There's some aspects of what Landmark teaches, uh, but there's also, it's, it's an older style of, of really understanding words and understanding like base words, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like the words that we use when we think or when we speak, you know, sentences are made out of words our bodies innately know the definitions of things and we have a different physiological reaction to different words, right? You know, we've yes, all talked yes. ourselves into a bad mood before. We've talked ourselves into a good mood before. And we know what a bad mood feels like physically and mentally and emotionally. And we know what a good mood feels like physically, mentally, and emotionally. And there are two different 
sets of words that create those two different emotional physiological states. And when I started to dive into the actual power of words and the magic behind words, you know, even in, in definitions themselves, you know, for example, um, if I say abracadabra, what do you think of? I think of a magician on stage with a big top hat and a cape. Love it. Magic. Everybody says some version of magic. Uh, apparently one person that I've asked that to said Pokemon, because there's a Pokemon character named Abracadabra, but he was an anomaly. It was an outlier, right? <laughs> uh, like, you know, 999 out of the thousand people are going to say something that along with magic. Hmm. So it turns out that word is an Aramaic word. It was one of the two languages of the Old Testament. It's over 5,000 years old. It's known all over the world. And it means with my words, I create or with my words, I influence. And no kidding. That's what it means. Yeah. With my word, I create, or with my word, I influence. And so we, we associate all... it with magic. Yep. Dude, so I've we... got goosebumps all over my body right now. That's incredible. It's crazy. And so we all remember taking, as I drop half the stuff off my desk, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we all remember taking spelling in elementary school and middle school. And like, what is spelling? It's the formation of words, right? Well, the actual definition of a spell is a word or collection of words of great influence. Mm. So with my words, I create abracadabra. When we're speaking, we are literally casting spells by definition. And those spells are either light magic or dark magic. They're either working for you to architect the reality that you want for yourself, or they're working against you to create conflict internally and externally. And so when I understood this, and when I was taught this, and when I connected the dots on this, I realized that the stories we tell ourselves are the through line between literally everything else literally everything else and what story we tell ourselves becomes our reality and it goes you know uh, there's a very new agey like oh manifest what you want and just speak it into existence and like you know yes and you've got to come there's action that goes along with that there's you know intention that goes along with that there's a lot of reps that go along with that you know and uh our words and our stories and our breath dictate our reality period at least in my world I completely agree. And this this actually falls in line with another episode I recorded yesterday. Um, the lady that I was talking to, she is very intuitive and she has the same type of gift that I do where she knows things without knowing how she knows them. Hmm. And you mentioned the word download earlier. And so I know you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how words are energy. And she has this technique where she will intuitive what someone actually needs to say so she will say it and have them repeat it hmm. and she does this in a way it essentially it's digging down to the energetic blockage that's happening in the person and once you say that particular phrase or that particular word and you see them kind of whinge a little bit like aha that's where we need to go that's where we need to focus Love that. and yeah, so it falls right in line with that conversation. And so I'm, I'm very excited to continue talking to you about this because words are definitely energy. They carry power, they carry weight. And if you're speaking negatively about yourself, it will only produce negative results in your life. One of the coaches that I follow, David Bear, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him or not. He's, he's not like Tony Robbins huge, but he's working on it. And he has this this wheel that he talks about, which is basically, and I'll see if you agree with it or not. I personally think it's great, but the way that it breaks down is your beliefs influence your thoughts, your thoughts influence your emotions, your emotions dictate your actions, your actions determine your results and your results either reinforce or change your beliefs. What do you feel about that? I think it's pretty darn perfect. Uh, the only thing I would add would be the breath. Breath is hugely, hugely important in, in the equation. And um, why is that? I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I can. I can understand it. Uh, just on a, a purely emotional, you know, energetic level, I can understand it. But cognitively, I'm wondering where it fits in. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our perception of our reality is dictated by our nervous system state. 
right? And so words, I can say, I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate my life. My life sucks. God, this is, this is, right? And even just saying that jokingly on a podcast, I've got some tension in my sternum. I feel myself kind of like, ugh, like, like those are poisonous words, right? Yeah. But what I also noticed is my breath started to become shallow, high up in my chest, out in and out through my mouth. I started to get into a uh, upregulated nervous system state, a sympathetic nervous system state, a fight, flight, or freeze nervous system state. The other way we can access that is, <laughs> you know, I do that for another 30 seconds and I'm also going to be upregulated, upregulated, right? Well, the kicker here is that the only way to downregulate is through our breath. When our exhales are longer than our inhales, sometimes it happens in the form of the uh, physiological sigh. We see kids do this a lot after they stop crying. <laughs> right? Oh, interesting. Okay, calm down. Take a deep breath. Count to 10 and breathe. Right? Any of these things, what we're doing is we're pulling ourselves into the parasympathetic nervous system state, which is rest and relax or feed and breed. And so... Our modern society, based on how uh, often we get notifications and all the things we quote unquote have to do and everything on our schedule and all the stimulation and, and all the, the outward stuff that's going on, plus our inward um, dissatisfaction with life oftentimes leads us to be in a chronic state of sympathetic fight or flight. And most people don't realize even that they're in there. They're just, oh, I'm stressed or oh, I'm tired or oh, I'm upregulated or oh, like I'm annoyed or oh, I'm frustrated and happens all the time. And they're most likely in that state just about all the time. Um, well, it's the words and the breath that pulls us out of that state. And when we focus on our breathing, when we focus on our breathing patterns and when we downregulate rhythmically, we are able to actually get into that state where we're able to process emotions, where we're, we're able to um, store memories, where our cells or our self are actually able to heal. And otherwise it ain't going to happen. And so what's really, really interesting about story work in particular is its versatility and being able to work past, present, future. And so I think it was developed originally to help people get through hurtful, traumatic, haunting experiences in the past, right? And we can't go back in time and change stuff, but we can change our perception to the things we've experienced. And so if I think about that thing that happened when I was seven or that thing he, he said, or the girl that broke my heart or, you know, the disappointment or, you know, whatever it is, like humans are the only ones that live things over a thousand times in our heads, right? Most other animals, like something happens and then you just move on, right? process it and move on. But the stuff from our past can bring up a lot of that fight or flight. And story work is a way to be able to go into those experiences again, down-regulate through steps to get to the point where you can now see things a different way and you're uh, outside of the story and you start to observe the story and down-regulate through the story so that those emotions can get up and out. And then there's the present day application and the future day application. But um, you know, ultimately story work is the through line between past, present, future. It's the through line between, you know, our connecting our, our brains and our minds and our thoughts to our physical bodies. And it's just the most effective thing I've ever seen or worked with personally or professionally. Yeah. Because breath is life. You know, if you yes. don't have breath, if you stop breathing, you're not going to live very long. And so if you focus your attention solely on breathing, feeling your belly expand, feeling your diaphragm and lungs expand and focusing on exhaling through your mouth for longer than you've inhaled and feel what it feels like as that breath enters your nostrils, feel what it feels like to go down into your system. You take your mind into that yeah, you can't think about anything else. You can't have these stupid thoughts flapping in your head of I'm not enough or I should be doing this. None of that happens because you have to focus so much on just breathing. 
And I'm curious, I want to get your opinion on something. So I follow Alex Hormozzi and he has a very interesting and yet controversial stance on trauma and the stories that we tell ourselves. And what he basically says is there is no such thing as trauma. There's only the experience and what we tell ourselves or have been told about that experience that we should think. I'm wondering if you, again, it's very controversial, but I'm wondering if you agree with that or you could put some more caveats to it or what are your thoughts? I recently unfollowed Alex Hormozzi. Because, oh, okay. Yeah, because <laughs> um, it's. I think it's incredibly clear that, and I'll even go a step further. There are two people I want to story work more than anybody else, and it's Alex Hormozzi and David Goggins, right? Uh, scientifically, trauma, a traumatic experience, is one that's defined as actually changing our brain and changing our physiological state. Like that's the definition of trauma: it's something that happens and it changes our brain negatively, right? And it's it's part of a again a fight flight or front fight <laughs> fight flight or freeze response uh and our bodies are trying to keep us aware and like make us understand that like whoa if this thing happens again like be on alert right um alex has a very uh oft spoken negative relationship to his dad to what his dad you know judged him for and things if you know, his upbringing, his dad wasn't proud of him and et cetera, et cetera. And as a, you know, a mental health professional, it's almost painful to listen to some of his interviews and, you know, hear him talk about the things that he talks about and the way that he talks about it. I think he's been running on dirty fuel for a really long time. And it's obviously worked to a degree for him. Um, you know, it worked to build financial success and to help people, you know. Uh, I also think that, you know, I don't think he's happy. And I think he knows that he's not, and he'd be lying if he said that he was. And, um, you know, so I, I disagree with the stance and I believe that his dirty fuel is, uh, not going to, you know, it'll get you off the ground, but it is not going to get you to cruising altitude and it sure as heck won't get you to your, to your destination ultimately. Yeah, I like that. I like that definition of dirty fuel. And I, I agree with you. Um, cause I, obviously I've, follow him, watch him. And, and yeah, whenever he talks about his relationship with his dad, it's always, it's always in a negative connotation, basically, especially in the past, you know, now yeah. it seems like they might've gotten things a little bit better, a little bit more patched up, but yeah, it's still, still something that you can see, even though he doesn't want to admit it, you can see it energetically that it affects yeah, there's him. A dark, there's a dark aura. Yes. Um, Yes. Around him to a certain degree. And, and I'm not judging in any way, shape or no. form. No, if not at all. Just, uh, an observation that I have from a, an energy reading perspective, as well as a professional perspective of, you know, the words that he uses are, it's conflict language. It's not architect language, it's conflict language. And it's uh, a pattern of, um, you know, like we all have to tell ourselves a certain story about what happened, you know, in our lives in order to make sense of it and, and, frankly, like move on, right. right. Uh, operate in the day to day, you know, so there, I think there are many things to admire about Alex. And I also think that there's some big time gaps in, uh, his life experience, um, satisfaction factor when it comes to, to the stories he's telling himself. Yeah. And I would, I would agree with that. And like I said, I just wanted to kind of get your take on it. So thank you for that input. I think that's gonna, I think that's going to help people and, and, especially if there's other business people that follow Alex that are watching this it may have a, a pause for them to just do a little bit of reflection on the inputs that they're gathering and how it affects their own life and moving forward away, you know, into helping people. I'm wondering what are the stories that people are telling themselves? What have you seen as like the most common like recurring stories that people are telling themselves these days. So there's the stuff that comes up from the past, right? And a lot of that is, you know, obviously we've had positive past experiences, but we've all been hurt in some capacity. Uh, we've all had things that have occurred that have changed us, which it would be by definition traumatic. Some of us have even had haunting experiences, which is the 
really messed up stuff that happens in society, unfortunately, that horror movies and stuff are made out of, right? And, you know, um, that's past stuff and that creates a lot of negative thought patterns, negative emotions, you know, just it's heavy. It's heavy. It's like you've been on a rock, you had a barbell on your back, you had a heavy backpack full with school books, you take it off. It's like, oh, so much better. I feel so much lighter. Like that's the experience once we get that stuff up and out. But as far as stories that are very common, if there's a video version of this, I've got the light wolf, dark wolf behind me here. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. There's the, the, we're recording video and I did want to, cause I noticed that because of, it looks like the yin and yang and I'm also a martial artist. So I, my eye went to that and I wanted to ask you about it. So I'm glad we're going there. So keep going. Yeah. So, uh, we all have an inner critic or an inner bully or an inner crap talker we'll say. Right. And what I really love is disassociating that voice from ourselves. Because a lot of us think that it's us that's saying it. And and the story of the two wolves, the legend of the two wolves, it's an old Native American proverb that goes something along the lines of, you know, a shaman, medicine man, grandfather, grandmother, sage person is, you know, telling a story of the battle between two wolves. And this battle has been waged inside every single one of us since the very beginning of time. It will always be waged inside every single one of us throughout all of our lives. And it's the battle between the light wolf and the dark wolf. And the dark wolf manifests itself as evil and anger and fear and greed and jealousy and hatred and sadness and depression and et cetera, et cetera. And the light wolf manifests itself as joy and peace and love and kindness and altruism and, and goodness and, and, you know, positivity and et cetera, et cetera. And somebody asks, well, which wolf wins? And they say, the one you feed, the one you feed. That's and right. I think so many of us spend so much time feeding that dark wolf that it becomes really big and scary and snarly and, um, you know, uh, overpowers the light wolf and we can't kill the dark wolf. Eventually we can befriend it and understand that it's there for a reason, but ultimately it comes down to stopping the treat giving of you know to the to the dark wolf you know like you're giving it t-bones and ribeyes and if you've ever trained a dog before you always have treats in all of your pockets you know and so you're like constantly giving the dark wolf food and making it big and ignoring the light wolf and so that comes in you know the form of i'm not good enough uh, aka imposter syndrome that comes in the form of you know oh, i always make mistakes uh nobody loves me i'm not worthy i'm not you know this i'm not that it's 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 all the negative stuff that frankly we all say to ourselves in some capacity in some degree at certain points of our lives most of which we would never say to another human being especially another human being that we know and love right you're not going to say any of this stuff to your spouse or your wife or you know, your, your kids or anything like that, but we say it to ourselves. And so one of my favorite exercises with clients, and it's frankly, one of the first or second things that I do with, with almost everybody is getting into that dark wolf conversation where we name the dark wolf and we write out verbatim what it says on your worst days. Right. And we start to disassociate that and put distance between ourselves and that story. And what's actually on the screen or on the page. And what that does is it creates that, that level of separation and it creates, uh, eventually our, we're able to acknowledge and see when, when, you know, that dark wolf is, is talking crap. You know, my latest client, the one I, I worked Friday called his despair, right? So his dark wolf's name is despair, right? But conversely, we'll also, after a session or two, once we start to actualize ourselves with this concept, we'll go in and name the light wolf. And then I'll translate what the dark wolf says and not turn it from English to Spanish or Spanish to English or French or whatever. It's like, we'll say, we'll just do the opposite, you know? So mm -hmm. the dark wolf says, I hate myself, tells me I hate, I hate you or I hate myself, right? Well, the dark wolf or the light wolf then is going to say, I love you or you know, I love myself. And it's the, just the opposite word pattern of that thing. And so we name our light wolf, this gentleman named his hope. And so you got knew it and despair. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so 
Now what we're able to do is we're able to use words, a different category of words, architect language, as I like to call it, and we are able to feed hope with affirmations and mantras and intentions that are very meaningful because they came from a prior limiting belief and they're they're not read off the internet you know and some oh i'm repeating my affirmations it's like no this is something that like is deep down in here for me right and not only are we feeding hope and making hope stronger that light wolf but we're also making despair weaker and we're able to like see it and shine a flashlight on it and, and understand when it comes up when we have that negative self-talk when we find ourselves in a shame spiral or a negative feedback loop, it's like, no, that's not me. That's not, you know, uh, the self with a capital S or the, the soul with a capital S, right? That's, that's just despair. That's just my dark wolf talking. And it, it is profound for helping people to overcome that negative self-talk. Yeah, because if you're able to, and, and we want to do this naturally as humans anyway, we want to define things. We mm -hmm. want to put a label on it, put it in a box. So if you can define and name this dark wolf, yes, I could understand how it'd be immensely powerful in helping this transformative process. And speaking of, you mentioned the word disassociation or disassociate from these, these dark wolf thoughts from yourself. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, how, how do you help someone start that disassociation process so that they can see that it's not actually, quote unquote, them that's thinking these things, it's the wolf or that voice, where does, where, okay, so two parts. How do you start disassociating and where does that dark wolf's voice come from? Hmm. Answer to the first one is we write it down. We write it down. And that's the biggest step is taking a story out of our heads. And, and if any, any story that can be written down, we title it, we write it down, we can work it. We can work that story, right? But if we take something out of our head and we put it onto the, the page, 99% of my clients are via Zoom and a Google Doc, right? So when I say put it on paper, what I mean is that we're typing it onto a Google Doc together, right? But, you know, we're taking a story out of their heads, putting it onto the page. And now instead of being the director, the main character, playing, acting out the scene in real time, being in the story, now we are observing the story as a, a member of the audience in the movie theater you know maybe you're you're still the actor and the director but it's like now you're like uh, you're watching the screenplay of it you know and and you're eating your popcorn and drinking your soda pop and you know it, there's distance and space in between that story and you and so that's where that disassociation come from comes from is it's taking it out of our heads where it's uh, sounds like a lot like static, right? It's like, you know, it's like that, right? And, and you know, with this just back and forth and loops and you're not going anywhere and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're putting it somewhere else and creating that space and that distance. So that's where that disassociation comes from. Um, remind me of the second part of your question. Um, so the second part of the question is, so how do you create the distance and where does the wolf's voice come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, well, based on the lore of the tale, it's just, we're born with these two things inside of us, right? You know, we're born, all of us are born with the light wolf and the dark wolf. And it's almost like, you know, the angel or the devil on the shoulder to, you know, there, right? Uh, what I think also is very real is we all have an upbringing, right? We all have things and people who we were influenced by at a certain point in our life, you know, most dramatically from ages, you know, one to seven, you know, uh, and then we're probably, and that's typically by our parents or caregivers. And then, you know, from 11, 12 through high school and into college, it's by our peers, you know, and then nowadays it's by whatever you're reading or nourishing yourself with on the internet or movies or music or, you know, uh, society or culture or whatever it may be. And so I think a lot of these voices of I'm not enough, you know, that comes from comparison, com com comparison yourselves, comparing yourselves to, um, you know, whatever else you're seeing. Um, uh, a lot of the inner critic stuff that might be a parent or that might be a sibling or that might be a friend, you know, who is not evolved or, uh, maybe hasn't worked their own, 
story or gone through their own evolution and trauma, you know, and, and frankly, you know, Brian, a lot of these stories aren't ours and they're not our stories to carry, you know, like, uh, they're ancestral, so to speak. And this is where epigenetics comes in, which is a fascinating part of this entire conversation. But, um, you know, the, the stories we tell ourselves, not only may they, are they not always real, but they're not always ours either. I a hundred percent agree with that. I believe that these experiences that our parents had, our grandparents, our great grandparents, and just on farther down the line that they, these experiences they've had in their lives have all trickled down through the generations and just manifested in different ways. You know, what your great granddad would have, would have thought as, you know, maybe a, a horrific, terrifying experience when he processed it and then passed it on to his kids, his kid internalized it as a different thing. And yet it comes from the same source. You know, you know what's, really, what's really crazy about that is the example I was going to give was almost exactly that. So my mother is an angel. She's a saint. She's the one that broke the generational curse, or as I like to put it, I don't like breaking generational curses. I like creating generational love. That's the translation that, that I came up with to that. It's like, let's create generational love instead. And that's to her credit what she's done. But her mother, my grandmother is a piece of work, put it to you that way real piece of work. And I resented her for a very long time. And my mother's had a very difficult relationship with her mom, my grandmother for, you know, as long as she's been alive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was someone who was, uh, actively and passively hurting my mom, you know, and throughout my whole childhood and into my adulthood and even now. And so like, I had this, like the story of, you know, well, my grandmother is, is, I don't like my grandmother. Right. You know, uh, uh, She's not a good person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When I started to understand epigenetics and when I got curious, I started to poke around and ask and learn about her, my grandmother's story and where her ancestors came from and what had happened you know, uh, down, the, um, down the ancestral line, so to speak, right? And her father was born in 1900 and lied about his age and enlisted in the army in 1917 as a 17 year old and went to the front lines of, of the greatest worst war in the history of wars, which was world war one. Right. And he was in France trench warfare as a 17 year old kid, uh, made it back and he had dark black hair and brown eyes as a 17 year old. And he came back with, uh, permanently bloodshot eyes and bleach white hair and he had he what they termed as shell shock right and what we know now is ptsd you know and just a horribly yeah horrible case of that right um well he didn't know how to process the terrible unfathomable things he saw and experienced and went through and did and otherwise over there as you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do I mean, that. How, how would you as a how kid? Could you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and he turned to alcohol and he made a vow to never leave Rockingham County, Virginia for as long as he lived. And he broke that vow three times to uh, visit his cousin one County over, but otherwise from 17 to when he passed away from alcoholism at 45 years old, he never left his home essentially. And he, he drank, he beat my grandmother. He was a terrible, you know, terrible person, quote unquote. And if, you know, from the standpoint of having some empathy and some compassion and some, you know, uh, looking at it from a different angle, my God, man, like it, it put things into perspective as far as how my grandmother became the, the way that she is because of her formative years, formative years and her upbringing during that time frame, And so it gave me a lot of grace and compassion doesn't excuse it, no, but it helps me to understand it yes. and to help me to, you know, now I can call her on Christmas and have a nice conversation. And I wish her that, you know, the best still with some distance and some boundaries and whatnot, but, uh, it totally changed my viewpoint on stories. And, and frankly, it changed my viewpoint on 
giving people understanding because we're all human beings. We all were little kids. We all were innocent and are just, you know, dealing with life the best that we can. Right. And so I got a great lesson in life from learning those stories about my, my great grandfather and how his life affected, you know, my mom's and my own. Yeah. Something that I just want to reiterate for anybody that's listening and maybe struggling with this themselves, there's two things to understand. Number one, what you are going through, it is not a hundred percent your fault. It is not your responsibility to carry that weight throughout your entire life. However, it is your responsibility to take upon yourself the understanding and the discipline to not put those dark thoughts, that black wolf into action against another person. Yes. Because just like Dave just said, it does not excuse the behavior. It only helps us understand why it's happened and give a level, not completely, it doesn't have to be completely, but give a level of forgiveness to that person. Because just like you said, man, we are all human. We're all dealing with stuff. It's like this, um, this quote that's out there everywhere on social media, at least on my feed right now, it's basically be kind whenever you can, because you don't know what someone else is dealing with. 100% accurate, man. 100% accurate. And, and, you know, those haunting stories, right. Which I would put serving in the military and dealing with, you know, whatever that he dealt with is in the category of haunting. Like that happens way more than we may imagine. And there are very, very strong, very normal, adjusted, kind hearted people who have been through a whole load of crap that they may never, ever, ever, ever tell you or express or, otherwise. you know, and just it's happening right now uh, in the border of my state. Mm -hmm. It's happening all along the southern border of the United States right now. Just this insane level of of trauma and of acceptance of something that that should not be happening. But yet we we almost feel powerless to do anything about it. And I have no idea the epigenetic ramifications of what this kind of experience is going to have on us as a country, as a society, no idea, but it is playing out right before our eyes. And I just pray that we will be able to get it under control and, and stop it, but stop it with a level of empathy and compassion that has not been seen yet. Yeah. I just, I pray that that happens. My favorite affirmation is I love myself. My second favorite and most shared affirmation is better me, better everyone. And oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and it goes along with, you can't pour from an empty cup. You got to pour from a full cup, right? You know, but it's, it's a, I believe my definition, my personal definition of impact is the ripples that we create and send out into our world. And those ripples can be negative. We can have a negative impact and those ripples continue out where we can have a positive impact and those ripples continue out and better me, better everyone is a guaranteed way to send out positive ripples into the world. And so, you know, is Brian or Dave going to be able to change the border situation? Like probably not, <laughs> unfortunately. Probably not, but we no, can be a positive voice. We exactly. can be a positive influence to help facilitate that change or at least give it a chance. And, and even if we're not talking about it specifically or campaigning for it or, you know, sharing our thoughts or viewpoints or, you know, fostering or whatever it is, we, by, by taking responsibility and control of the stories we tell ourselves and by being a better me, we then thus help raise the consciousness and level of everybody else around us, whether or not they're one degree of separation away or a hundred degrees of separation away. And so if all of us listening and, and otherwise focus on better me, better everyone, you're, you're going to get better by definition, better me, your family unit's going to get better. The people you work with are going to get better and heal. Those people's family units are going to get better. Right. And then we can continue to ripple outward. And that's why I love platforms like this and platforms like you've created is, you know, whoever listens to this will be able to hopefully take something positive from it and then go and able to implement it and 
utilize that better me, better everyone, even if it's a degree, because one degree change is an entirely different trajectory down the road. So that's a hundred percent. Right. And I, I just thank you so much for coming on here today. It's been incredible and I'm getting emotional because I know how powerful this conversation has been. So definitely thank you for that. And I was curious, you're, the thing you speak about, at least from what I can gather on your site, the most is imposter syndrome. And I'm wondering who you work with, like who, who is the type of person that is Dave's client? Is there a specific niche that you focus on? This is a great question. And the marketing people out there are going to be like, no, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, I'm just being honest. My youngest client that I've ever worked with is eight. My oldest client is is 82. For a long time, it was 80, but I did a session with an 82 year old a couple of weeks ago. Um, for most of 2023, I worked with uh, men, probably 25 to 45. My last seven clients have been female, right? So I don't have a specific niche as far as, you know, a target market. Uh, the stories that I would say that I'm best at are exactly what you said, imposter syndrome, which is identity. That's my sub word for that. It's how do you define yourself, right? Um, negative self-talk. Uh, I spent a long time in addiction recovery work, you know, working with folks who are overcoming substance abuse and, and otherwise. And uh, because of that, I am incredibly adept and uh, able and willing to work those hurt, haunted, heavy stories. Uh, what I like to work the most is once we clear all that space, I like to look forward with people because that's the, that's where I can get my creative writing in. And that's where I can, you know, start to really do a whole bunch of forward, fun, focused stuff down the road, which goes way beyond setting smart goals. You know, it, <laughs> it's, uh, helping people to architect the reality that they want for themselves, you know, but most people come to me I would say 50% come to me with a story or two or three from the past that is really negatively affecting them in the present day. And the other 50% of people are coming to me because they're quote unquote stuck. And they're just like, Ugh, I just don't feel good. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here, et cetera, et cetera. And that often is because of identity and negative self-talk. Yeah, perfectly said. And I can't believe it. It's been, it's been an hour already and this has gone by like so fast. And Dave, I, I want to ask you if you'd be open to coming back on for a second show, because we focused more, I think, on the dark wolf this time. On mm -hmm. the second episode, I'd really love to focus more on the white wolf. Mm. What I would do you love, think? I would love that. I think that would be super, super cool. Um, and what I'd also love to do in the interim is I'd love to gift you, offer you a free story work session so you can experience this and have it. And then, you know, you can share all of it or none of it or whatever you want in between, you know, but I think having an understanding for you of what it is that we're actually doing would really help to dictate how that conversation goes. And that would be my honor and a thank you for, you know, having me on your platform, not just once, but twice to, to talk about this stuff. So that would be super cool. Well, I definitely accept that and we will figure that out so we can make that happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, incredible. Man, so Dave, where can people find you, learn more about you, get into your world and, and maybe book that initial session to start work on their story? I can be found online at workyourstories.com. Workyourstories.com is my website. I'm also on Instagram at daverobinson.coach, daverobinson.coach. Uh, those are my two preferred platforms right now. Uh, I've also got a, a bunch of podcasts out there, but you know, my name isn't John Smith or as far as popularity, but it's, it's not particularly unique. So you may have to shift and, and sift around, uh, on the podcast world to find other, other shows, but there's a bunch of them out there if you look, but workyourstories.com and, uh, at Dave Robinson.coach are the, are the two best places to find me. Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, guys, Links are going to be below, so you can just click, go right there, check Dave's Instagram, check his website. And again, if you resonate with this conversation, if you feel within your gut that you need this, reach out, reach out, because I already know this man is powerful. He has a purpose and a mission, and he will help you 100%. But Dave, 
Thank you again so much for coming on, brother. It's been an absolute pleasure. I appreciate you very much, man. I'm really looking forward to, to continuing our conversations. 100%. All right, everybody, share the show, like the show, share it out with a friend that needs to see this, that is maybe struggling, or if you yourself is struggling, just reach out to Dave, do what you can to get this information out, and let's feed that white wolf. Peace. I'll see you in the next one.